Say good morning, everyone. Say that the are going to start at half past. And we're going to lift up our voices to the one who we love. And uh, so if you just like to stand. And just to say again, welcome. It's good to be together. And we're looking forward later in the service. Simon's going to bring the word. We're going to seek to follow Holy Spirit's lead. And we're going to also have the opportunity to share bread and wine together. Jesus shared bread and wine with his disciples. Before he shared the bread and wine, he gave thanks. So we're going to start. Before we share the bread and the wine, we're going to give thanks. So let us give thanks this morning to the one who gave his life for each one of us who shed his blood, who died a cruel death on the cross for each one of us that we might have life. And Lord Jesus, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for this meal. We thank you, Lord, for this bread and this wine. We thank you, Jesus, for your glory. And Holy Spirit, we thank you for your precious presence amongst us this morning. And so, Lord, as we come to worship, Holy Spirit, would you help us to focus on the one, the one who gave his everything. Praise his name. Amen. Amen.
on islands that began praising your name as the sun rose. And Lord, as sure as the sun rises, so surely does your love extend to us. And across the world there has been a wave of praise rising and mounting and growing and, and magnifying your name. And in the same way, Lord, from the very get-go, Lord, as Jesus <coughs> rose from the dead, people yes. praised you. Yeah. People praised you. And we get to do our bit today, Lord, in 2024. This is our time to praise you. And Lord, we want to say we're holding nothing back. We're holding nothing back as we praise, praise you Lord, in our time, in our place, and in this age.
the one who gave his life, the one who is now raised to life, the one who is sitting on a throne, who reigns, the King, our Majesty. I just sense he speaks a word this morning to us. He speaks a word to our hearts. And he says again, he says again a familiar word, but let it drop into your heart again this morning. I have chosen you. I choose you. I have thought about you even before I created you. I thought about you. And I have chosen you. And really it's nothing to do with anything you have done or will do. But I have set my mark upon you. I have put a ring on your finger. I have by a covenant love. I have chosen you. I want you to know again, just to remind you, how I love you. I am the king who reigns over all things. I hold everything in my hands. Everything. The stars, the everything. And I want you just to know, I choose you. I love it when you glorify my name. I love it in this relationship with you. And I love it just for you to know, I choose you. Amen. Amen.
real sense that as we're singing these songs, it's a quite a familiar song, we all know it, and we can almost just say it with, just because we know it. But I really felt that there was weight on those words. I'm no longer a slave yes. to fear. Yes. And I feel it is relevant to, to several people in this room who are struggling with fear, that you, it's not that the Lord says you won't feel fear, but that you're no longer a slave to fear. What that means is that fear is no longer going to dominate your choices and decisions. The Lord gave me a bit of a visual picture, and it was a bit physical, and some people are a bit uncomfortable with this, but literally as we sing that song, I literally felt like the Lord was saying, get out and stomp on it. So I want to encourage people just to engage with this word. If fear is something that has had a weight in your life and has restricted you, you will feel fear at times, but the Lord will, if you partner with the Lord, you will no longer be controlled by fear, but this is something you have to engage in. Now, I believe it's a moment where the Lord can break off strongholds of fear.
He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. There is no fear in love. How do we conquer fear? We receive his love. We remind ourselves his gracious, absolute Father's love for you and I. Lord, we thank you, Holy Spirit, how you remind us in our very hearts and minds that we are children of God. Nothing can separate us from your love. Lord, where there has been fear, Lord, overwhelm us with your love, with your light. Thank you, Lord, that your light of love outshines us, kicks out darkness and fear. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Lord, would you solidify, Lord, what you're speaking to us in this moment in our hearts and in our minds. Lord, may we know that security of your love, unconditional covenant love. I will never leave you. I will always be with you. And fear has no place. Fear be gone in the name of Jesus. Fear be gone in the name of Jesus. You have no place in the body of Christ. And we are no longer slaves to fear. We're no longer slaves to fear. We are no longer slaves to fear. Because the love of God has covered us through the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. We're going to do things just a little bit differently because we want to give some real good time for communion and sharing bread and wine. So can we just welcome Simon as he comes to bring us the word today. Can I pray? Lord, we love Simon. We love you, Lord. and We love the partnership. Lord, God, we just pray, Holy Spirit, that all that you put in Simon's heart and mind, Lord, we would receive and hear. Lord, may you anoint and bless Simon in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, good morning. I'm going to put my glasses on, not because I can't see you, but I can't see you. <laughs> That's why they're kind of off moon, so I can go over them. Yeah. Uh, we've been considering discipleship in our current series. Dave kicked us off uh, back in September with an introduction to the series. And uh, we've since heard from Stuart on the invitation to follow Jesus. From Carenza on denying self. Dave again on transformation of beholding Jesus. And last week from Grantly on Jesus' words, as the Father sent me, so I am sending you. This week we should be considering the fact that we are called to purpose. Jesus' mission and our mission. We're going to be thinking about Jesus' mission and our mission. If you dedicated your life to Christ, then you are a disciple. Did you know that? Or at least that's what you ought to be. That's what you're supposed to be. Someone who is following Jesus, being changed by Jesus, and is committed to the mission that Jesus has given to us. I looked up the word disciple in the dictionary, and the dictionary is wrong. <laughs> because I sometimes find this, um, but the dictionary is biblically wrong. The dictionary describes uh, the word disciple, defines the word disciple as being 
one of the twelve who followed Jesus. Now, if that was true, that would be tragic. Because that would mean that Jesus' mission died out 2,000 years ago, when the last of the disciples died out. But thankfully, he gave them a commission to make disciples of all nations, and they took it seriously, and that's why we're here today. Stuart referred uh, earlier to a relay that we were part of, a relay of worship uh, across the world. It's a relay of following Jesus since he first came. Now, we're going to be considering the mission of Jesus and the mission that he gave us. A key part of the mission of Jesus could only be fulfilled by him. Only he came fully God, fully human, and lived a sinless life, gave himself for us in order to deal with the problem of our sins, past, present, and future, once and for all at the cross. Only he could do that. There is only one person who has ever lived who could do that. And that was the Son of God himself. That's the John 3.16 part. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but receive eternal life. The Gospels tell us that Jesus set his face like flint with steely, unwavering determination to fulfil his mission to go to the cross, sacrificing himself in our place in order that our sins would be dealt with so that we could come into relationship with God, a God who made us and loves us, as we've just been hearing. As I pointed out last week, this part of Jesus' mission was completed as he died on the cross. His last words being, it is finished. It's done and dusted. The issue of our sin, all that separates us from God, was dealt with in that moment on the cross. And that was demonstrated by graves opening, rocks splitting, his own resurrection to life forever as the firstborn of all those who receive that inheritance of eternal life, that we too will be raised to life. Only he could accomplish these things and that part of his mission was fully achieved back then. It's done and dusted. But as glorious as this is, it's not the limit of Jesus' mission. We don't have a gospel that just sorts out the problem of what happens to us when we die. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life, and life to the full. Mm -hmm. After Jesus was baptised, he was tempted for 40 days in the wilderness, and he came straight from there, full of the Holy Spirit, and began teaching in the synagogues. And people were amazed. Luke 4 tells us that at the synagogue that Jesus has attended as a boy, he declared his mission by reading from Isaiah chapter 61, and by stating that Isaiah's prophecy was fulfilled in him. Here's what he read. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. 
He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Does that sound good? <clears throat> he went about proclaiming the good news about himself, teaching people how they could live in obedience to God's ways and how that leads to full life and to fullness of joy. He went about healing the sick and the lame and the blind, releasing people from darkness, raising the dead, and he followed God's prompting in demonstrations of holiness, of authority, obedience to God, humility, and his love, compassion, and mercy. When he prayed at Gethsemane, on the night he was arrested, he said in his prayer to God the Father, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. It's recorded in John 17, verse 4. Just as his dying words were also, it is finished. There was a sense of completion. Jesus did not leave this earth not having accomplished his mission. So if Jesus' work on earth is finished, have we missed the boat? You know, did it all happen 2,000 years ago and that's it? Not at all. He accomplished the mission of making the way for us to have our sins dealt with once and for all and to enjoy life in relationship with God forevermore. He also accomplished in his earthly lifetime the proclamation of good news to the poor, of freedom of prisoners, sight for the blind, freedom for the oppressed, and um, for those in his day and in his locality. But these characteristics of the kingdom that he proclaimed are eternal characteristics. So they haven't gone away. We are in a relay. And uh, the spirit that was on Jesus, the Holy Spirit, has been sent to dwell in and to anoint all who follow Jesus. <clears throat> Even today. So the kingdom can be extended in the same way. There's a famous saying of Jesus uh, that, uh, where he said that uh, you will do even greater works than these. I believe that can be interpreted in the sense that Jesus did those amazing miracles, did those mighty acts in his time and in his locality. But those who have followed him down the centuries since have spread that into all the world and continue to do so. Greater acts than these. Grantly reminded us last week that Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. So what is our mission? Or rather, what is the mission Jesus has sent us to achieve? Here, is what Jesus prayed for you and me just before he was arrested and then crucified. Did you know Jesus prayed for you and it's recorded in the Bible? Right. Here it is in John 17 verses 20 to 23. Receive this for yourself. I pray also for those who will believe in me through the message of the disciples that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me, and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them, 
and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So it seems that Jesus' first desire for us is that we should be one with God and in complete unity with each other, with the consequence that the world will know that God sent his Son and has loved us even as God loves Jesus. How are you doing with that part of the mission? Of course, we can't consider the mission Jesus has given us without considering the great commission in Matthew 28. All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. A few comments about this commission. All too often, I think this is misunderstood as it being that the sole responsibility of every individual Christian is to get as many people saved and baptised as possible. I believe that is an unhelpful interpretation. Jesus gave this commission to the 11 disciples who were with him at the time. I believe they were all faithful to this commission. And we know that some as individuals were outstanding in evangelism. But Jesus addressed them as a group. It is a mission that we have inherited jointly as members of Jesus' worldwide church. We all have a part to play in fulfilling this mission. None of us is exempt from giving an account for the faith that we have. None of us is exempt from that. But not all of us are called to knock on doors um, or to preach the gospel in the street, for example. Secondly, making disciples is not just getting people to the point of confessing Christ as their saviour. It involves teaching, encouraging and challenging them to be true followers, seeking to obey everything Jesus has commanded. We so often forget that part of the Great Commission where Jesus says, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. We all need to be taught everything Jesus has commanded. I can't actually remember the point at which I gave my life to the Lord because I was very young when that happened. Certainly it was more than 60 years ago. I need you to teach me about Jesus' commands. And you need me to teach you about Jesus' commands. Just because someone is saved and baptised, and wanting to follow Jesus doesn't mean that the work is done. We all need teaching, encouraging and challenging in order that we are ready and able to obey everything that Jesus commanded. Indeed this and the complete unity Jesus prayed for us are the main biblical reasons I believe we should gather on Sundays and at other times during the week to encourage and challenge one another, to work at becoming at complete unity with one another 
in him. Encourage, challenge, and support one another in obeying the commands that Jesus has taught us. So, we're doing things a bit differently in this season. So, um, that's the point at which I stop talking and the point at which we start uh, considering the things that I've brought to you, inviting the Holy Spirit to search our minds, hearts, and souls. And um, we're going to do this this morning by uh, just getting into twos and threes. Now, it needs to be no more than twos or threes, because uh, we're limited on time. But uh, uh, I'd like you to, uh, to get into twos and threes any minute now, and uh, to consider, I've got three questions for you to consider together in your twos and threes. Firstly, what part of proclaiming good news to the poor Freedom for prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, setting the oppressed free, and proclaiming the year of the Lord's favour. Do you find the most challenging for you to do? And or which part do you want more anointing for? Because we all have the anointing of the Spirit to do those things. Secondly, what part might you play in reaching complete unity with fellow believers? What active part might you play? And then thirdly, what part can you best play in the corporate mission of making disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything Jesus commanded? Okay, go! <laughs>
Jackie just uh, asked me uh, a, a question whether I was going to encourage people to pray for one another, to which my answer is, you are free to pray for one another. And that may be the most appropriate thing for you to do. So we, we have a few minutes left, so uh, feel free to carry on discussing, but if you want to pray for each other, pray for each other. Thank you. 
in two minutes, okay? move on because we should celebrate Jesus in the bread and the wine together. Paul teaches about the Lord's 
Sapa. Uh, I'm stuck with the translation in my head. A man ought to examine himself before taking um, the Lord, participating in the Lord's Supper. Of course, in that translation, what it means is a Christian, a person, should examine themselves before taking the Lord's Supper. Women are not exempt from examining. <laughs> but we, I, I guess we have already, to some extent, been examining ourselves, particularly on this question of unity. Paul was very hot on his instructions around the Lord's Supper and unity. Um, in uh, 1 Corinthians 11, um, he said, uh, in the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. He's not talking to us, he's talking to you. <laughs> In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. I'd encourage you to chew on that verse. Um, that's 1 Corinthians 11, 19. As we con continue to consider the unity that Jesus prayed for us together. In 1 Corinthians 10, 15, Paul wrote... I speak to sensible people. Are there sensible people here? <laughs> I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share the one loaf. We're going to remember Jesus now. He commanded us, every time you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Sometimes I think we get tripped up by that word remembrance. We're never quite sure. Uh, remembrance Sunday, we're never quite sure how are we supposed to feel around? Are we supposed to be grateful for those who laid down their lives? Are we supposed to mourn those who laid down their lives? I believe as we come in remembrance of Jesus, we come remembering Him as a person, Him, the Son of God, who was willing to humble Himself and call Himself the Son of Man for our sake. So we can remember him and celebrate what he has done for us. I'm not a very liturgical person, but uh, I found some notes on communion, which I'm going to read from in part, because I think they're quite good. Come to this table, not because you must, but because you may. Not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Come, not because of any goodness of your own gives you any right to come, but because you need mercy and help. Come, because you love the Lord a little and would like to love him more. Come, because he loved you and gave himself for you. Come and meet the risen Christ, for we are his body. Now the way I suggest we do this is uh, come, take some, there's some bread here, there's some wine, the lighter colour is non-alcoholic for those who prefer it. Um, come, 
collect some, take it back to the person or persons you were with uh, in the last few minutes and uh, share the bread and the wine with each other. Okay, so come. tells us, for I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Loving Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you for your love shown to us in Jesus Christ. We thank you for his life and ministry, announcing the good news of your kingdom and demonstrating its power by lifting up the downtrodden, healing the sick and loving the loveless. We thank you for his sacrificial death upon the cross for the redemption of the world and for raising him to life again as a foretaste of the glory that we all shall share. We give you thanks for this bread and wine, symbols of our world and signs of your transforming love. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come that we might be renewed into the likeness of Jesus Christ and formed into his body. In Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Feel free to pray out your own prayers of thanks.
okay. Um, Dave has some notices for us, uh, but before we get to those, can we just say the grace together? So look at each other and bless one another. <coughs> grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Simon, thank you so much for that word. Um, yeah. Isn't the word rich? Yeah. So when you see them, you go them a special thank you, Shelley. They'll love it. Yeah. They were fantastic. So yes, I've, I've got two uh, notices. Um, my apologies, I didn't upload the, the graphics, but they're in the new sheet. Um, next Sunday, we have our next uh, worship and prayer night uh, here in the chapel, 7.30 uh, to about 9 o'clock. Now, I'd love just to clarify, calling it worship and prayer, the focus for that evening is we want to just come before the Lord and pray according to his will. We want to be led by Holy Spirit in what we pray for, praying for this church, praying for one another, praying for this nation, praying for the nations. We want to be led by Holy Spirit. We want to intercede. We want to pray with all that God gives us. We want to be Holy Spirit led in this. But we want to do this in the context of worship. We do it in the context of worship. And that's where it's not a worship evening as such. It's not like we're going to come and worship. But we are wanting to be in a place of worship. Because that's the place to be in. In his presence, responding to the Holy Spirit. But with eager hearts to pray his will. So next Sunday, 7.30 till about 9 o'clock in the chapel. Um, secondly, uh, that's... Is coming some that's next Sunday, 20, 20th of November. Uh, just a little reminder again, just for your diaries, Wednesday, 20th of, uh, 20th of November, um, we're having a, a, another fireside evening. Um, it'll be here. Um, we're likely to have a short meal if people want to have a meal beforehand, because come here at seven um, for half an hour meal, and then we'll start the fireside. Um, at 7.30. We've got just a number of things just to share which would be encouraging to hear, just news amongst us as family um, and we want to just also give opportunity to hear some encouraging, even more encouraging news of what God is doing amongst us. So that's going to be a great evening, 7.30 on the 20th of November. Wonderful. Thanks ever so much again. I'm very, very blessed and continue just to have blessed afternoons on a blessed day today. Amen. 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 Amen.